The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. This Thursday, as a nation, we're going to slow down and celebrate Thanksgiving, and there'll be many different reasons uh, to how and why people will celebrate it, and probably very few from its original intent of our national holiday. And what we have done here at Southside Bible Church is that Thanksgiving, we like to treat it like all the national holidays of our land, and we seek to redeem it for the edification of our souls. And so on Christmas, we really look and focus on the beauties of the incarnation and on Easter, the resurrection of Christ and our glorious freedom in Christ on July 4th. And so we do the same with Thanksgiving. So therefore, what we desire as your elders is that you would take some very focused time looking at the things that promote praise and thankfulness to our God. Romans 1 tells us that the, what characterizes the unbeliever is that he, he will not give thanks or glory to God. And the opposite would be true of the child of God as you just are one who thanks and praises and worships your God. And so I would like to lead us to a psalm this morning to set our hearts on Him and the praise and thankfulness that should abound in our hearts. And then tonight we're going to gather back here and we're going to have our first annual pie and praise. So I'm hoping to do it until the Lord comes back uh, every year. And so we're going to stick with that name, youth group, though the order uh, is going to be praise and then pie. That's how we'll function tonight. We, we almost changed the name when I heard that High was going to lead worship with Jordan tonight to High and Praise, but we're going to stick with Pie and Praise for tonight. So at the heart of what we'll do is we're going to open up the microphone to any who want to publicly declare what God has done or is doing in your life. So that tonight's service will be as long or as short as you want it to be. So I just want you to pray if God is putting on your heart where you just want to testify and give glory to God. Uh, for something that he's showing, doing, revealing to you. So it'll be an open mic as we just gather as the family of God to give him praise. So come ready to do that as a body. And I, I would love to see everybody back tonight. And, and I want you to work hard on your, your pies, okay? To really, I just think that's a beautiful part of it. I, I'm shooting for five pounds of weight gain tonight. Um, <laughs> Paul said, I buffet my body and make it my slave, and I just <laughs> feel obedient to that charge. So a reminder then, Thursday morning is our 21st annual turkey bowl, and the evolution has been amazing. We used to just have a few of us gather together. Now we got four games of very competitive, somewhat competitive, and, and then a girls game and a, a kids uh, with their dads in the fourth game. And I, I've just kind of moved my way down. And last year I quarterbacked the girls game. <laughs> and I told my daughter, Kelsey, I'm going to throw you a, a touchdown. And she was on the other team and she intercepted me and ran it for a <laughs> touchdown. That wasn't what I had in, in mind. So I'm going to do the kids game this year and I'm excited about that. And that starts at 9.30 in the morning at Parker Lutheran uh, High School. Well, let's go to our sermon this morning. If you'll open your Bibles to Psalm 103, <clears throat> just kind of a quick introduction to it. Well, I went out of the country for a season on my sabbatical and I hit like seven or eight different countries. And I just kind of enjoyed learning all the different cultures. And as I was flying back to the United States, we arrived in Denver and we had this long line to get through customs and it was moving very slowly. And all of a sudden, what I started hearing all around me was just grumbling and complaining, just kind of rising up all around. And it arrested me because it really had been three weeks since I had heard any of that. And all of a sudden, it was like you get out of it and you get back into it and you realize uh, how immune I had become to the spirit of the age in the United States of America. And in our country, grumbling and complaining seems to be one of the great characteristics of our land. And then I just realized how much it's lodged in my own heart because I was, I was just ready for my own shower and a bathroom and all these 
different things and you're just, you, you, you lose some of the luxuries and you start realizing just how pampered we become. And so uh, in pastoring a church, I'm amazed that the spirit bleeds over into the church as well. And we, we, we don't want to become the grumblers and the complainers. And so the scriptures rebuke this. I, I always think of Korah when they start grumbling and we're all holy, Moses. Who do you think you are? And the ground just opens up and swallows all of them <laughs> like that. Grumbling. Renew your minds. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't take on this culture. Don't live like it. Don't think like it. And it's just trying to permeate its way into the body of Christ. And we're separate. We've been changed. We've been taken. Our, our umbilical cord was attached to the world, and now it's attached to Christ. And we're not to be conformed and think like them and act like them. We should be a place characterized by praise and thanksgiving to our God versus grumblers and complainers. This should be the very essence of the people of God. And so this morning, I want to study Psalm 103 and show you what should fill our hearts Instead, So I want to call us this morning to repentance for anyone who needs it, <clears throat> to not be conformed to this world, to seek the face of God, and to be worshipers of his holy name, and be those who are filled with a genuine thanksgiving. It's, it's just natural, it's organic, it's spirit-filled, and it just comes out of us. We, we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus for all of eternity. The people of God should be an overwhelmed people with their God. And we should just be a people who you hit, you hit one key and you're just ready to sing his praises and worship him. And it just flows and overflows out of us. And so may God do specific and personal work in each one of our hearts this morning until what comes out of our lips and hearts is praise. And so worshipers is what Jesus is seeking in spirit and in truth, the Father seeks. And so I want that to be the fruit of our gathering this morning. So let's go to our God and ask him to meet us in a very special way. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the psalmist. I thank you for the inspiration of this psalm, Psalm 103. God, I pray now by your spirit that you would unfold it to our hearts, that we would understand it with our minds, our hearts would be inflamed, our wills would be activated to serve the King of Kings. And so, God, I pray now, let your people comprehend the glories and the beauties of your gospel that are in this psalm. And I pray for those who are lost in their circumstances and the events surrounding us as a country. God, lift their eyes to you and all of your glory this morning. God, let us be a thankful people for this indescribable gift of Christ Jesus. God, do what we need you to do in our hearts. No human being can produce this. And so, God, by your Spirit, through your Word, would you do that? Here this morning we pray. Amen. Psalm 103, um, as I've been studying this, it's almost beginning to feel like the book of Romans in one psalm. This psalm is so rich and full. I, I pray that everyone would, would labor in it and maybe even memorize it uh, in the weeks ahead. So just a, a few thoughts by way of introduction to this psalm. Just a few observations. First, I just want to help you with the setting and the psalms. There's 150 psalms, and some of you might not have noticed this before. There's five books. They'll say book one, book two, and they're, they're broken down into the five books. And the one that we're looking at this morning is found in the fourth book. And in the close of this fourth book, there are four psalms that close this out, Psalm 103 through 106. Look with me in Psalm 101, verse 1. <clears throat> <clears throat> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And then he closes it out in verse 22. Bless the Lord, all you works of his. And all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. Look at Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed in, with splendor and majesty. Verse 3, he, he, he says uh, more. And then flip over to verse 35 of 104. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. 
Psalm 105, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, speak of all His wonders. Glory in His holy name, let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord in His strength, seek His face continually. Remember His wonders which He has done, His marvels and the judgments uttered by His mouth. And then go to the end of the psalm in verse 45. So that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And go to the end of the psalm of verse 48. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting, all and let all the people say, Amen, praise the Lord, end of book four. I think it becomes very clear where the psalmist is leading in this book four. It's a need for the church to be reminded, to gather together and to bless the Lord that he alone is worthy. Let's gather and sing our praises unto this God. Second observation, I want you to notice the focus of this song The focus of this song is Yahweh, the great I am that we saw in John and all the beauty that we saw revealed and taught in that section and even going back to Exodus where he revealed himself as that. The writer is lost in love and wonder and praise in Psalm 103 as he contemplates his God. He's just enraptured and taken up with him. And what I love about this psalm as we come to Psalm 103, there's just no historical circumstances in this psalm at all. There's no event or occasion even mentioned. There's no enemies. There's no foes. There's no threats that he's writing about. There's no requests. There's no petitions. There's no complaints. There's just God and all of his glory in Psalm 103. This is the focus of the believer. This is what is to take up our hearts, God and what is revealed about him and his person and his acts throughout this word. And so here is the heart of the Christian church. Worship God. Worship Yahweh. True worshipers is what the Father is seeking. Pure worship. Joyful, thankful, overflowing, abundant praise to our God despite all our circumstances and everything that we're facing. It is good and it is right to give praise to our God. He is worthy of it. Amen? That's where the psalmist is taken up. Just again and again, bless God, praise Him. Sing His praises for who this God is. Third observation I want you to consider the author. It's pretty settled. It was David who's penning this psalm. And uh, some of the commentators believe it's an aged David. And, And so I love old age. And I just want to encourage you in one thing, don't fight it. Um, have a life lived watching the unfolding of what is presented in this psalm. Every year of life, I gain a little more wisdom to what is in this psalm and the beauties of my God. This is a heart that is full to bless the Lord and be amazed at all of His blessings and all of His benefits towards you. The unsaved grow in bitterness and the saved grow in gratefulness. Amen? My dad is my example as I've watched him age and he's growing in his love for Christ. I'll just be like, how how was your day? You know, I just spent all day thanking Christ for all that he's given me. I just, every time I talk to him, he just overflows with praise to God and talking about the beauties of other people. He doesn't have one negative thing every time I talk to him on the phone. He's just taken up by looking at his life and all the mercies that God has poured out upon him, that that's all he can talk about. That's what I see coming out of David, looking through his life and coming and saying, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. So my exhortation is to the Nike saints, and I'm in that group, and one of these days I'm going to make it to a potluck. It's, it's everybody's fault sitting around here that grabs me. Okay, so, so blame them. The Nike saints, lead us to the throne room. Lead. Teach us how to praise God for this. Teach us how to 
help those getting started right now with so many goals and desires and they're all caught up in what they're going to do and accomplish and God's going to change them and redirect them and break them and smash idols. I want you to shine and show us what should be our focus. What At the end of your lives, just keep showing us, guys, it's God. Anchor to him. Start your lives now as you're beginning. Set it on God and God alone. And young people, come learn from him. Come to the older people and just say, teach me what you've learned from all these years of journeying. I'm just loving learning from my dad. And just older people, get with them and learn from them. Don't buy the lie of society that I don't need to learn from someone older. That's just so anti-Christ and unbiblical. Stop. What a beautiful thing aged David is going to bring us to this sweet place this morning. And then fourthly, it's a sandwich. I hate all my illustrations being food. Um, but I just, I just think in sandwiches, or you can call it an inclusio, but at the beginning I see the bread of bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. And then he finishes the psalm, bless the Lord, all you works of his, just bless the Lord, oh my soul. And that's what this whole psalm is anchored in. And then the meat that's filling up this sandwich are the reasons why forget none of the benefits that God has given to you. And then he gives us 17 reasons in this psalm to bless the Lord. And so the goal and the aim of this psalm is to look at all that God has given us and to bless them. That's what David wants for the people of God as they gathered to worship. Fifthly, I want you to consider the fulfillment of this psalm. David wrote this a thousand years before Jesus was incarnated into this world. <clears throat> it's just such a rich psalm, but one that is picturing the greater, the greater David from beginning to end. It's really celebrating our great salvation. He talks about all of my sins being forgiven. How does a, did God quit being holy? Did God quit being just? How, how did he forgive all of David's sins? Well, the only way is by foreshadowing and faith and looking forward to the coming greater David who would come and accomplish salvation. The fatherhood and the loving kindness, the covenant of love that will fill this psalm is, is all going to come through the new covenant that Jesus Christ will procure by his life and by his death and resurrection. And so the, the greater uh, David is just throughout this psalm because none of these things can happen without him. None of this psalm is true without David looking forward to his seed who would sit on a throne whose kingdom would have no end. And so Christ is the only way that this psalm can be true. And so we're going to enter into its fullness because of the much greater revelation than David had. And guys, I believe our hearts should cry all the more. They should cry out, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name because I've seen the fullness of Christ and what he's come to this earth and what he did. And so I, I should be all the more just filled to the brim with blessing the Lord and praising him for all of his benefits and what I enjoy in the sweet Jesus Christ. Sixthly, how do we get there? Psalm 103. I'm going to go into detail in, in answering that, but that is what David is after. His own heart <clears throat> has been taken up in his great saving God. And he desires for the whole congregation to join him in blessing the Lord. And when we close, he wants the whole universe. And, and we'll walk those steps this morning. And my last observation is this is a Thanksgiving devotional. This is not uh, expositional. This psalm deserves, I, I believe, months and months. It's so deep, amazing, and rich. It should be mined. And so what we're going to go to this morning is just a little flyover and I'm going to leave it to you to, to go mine this psalm for gold. It is so rich. And I'm going to give you some outline and some things to consider as you go deeper with this. And I pray those who are heads of a family that you would take this psalm and you would lead your children to this or your, your friends or even your own heart uh, on Thanksgiving. So let, let's just pray one more time and then we'll open up Psalm 103. Father, I thank you for this psalm now that has been laid before us. And I pray now that your spirit will do what he <laughs> loves to do, and that's to turn a floodlight now on Jesus Christ, to shine a light on the glories of our God 
And so I pray now that you will meet us and these blessings would take every heart and turn them to praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so how do we get to the kind of worship that's flowing from David's heart in this psalm? Well, for your outline, if we have it, uh, I've broken it down into four ways of how we're going to bless the Lord. And the first one I want you to see is we need, we need to just look at God and His glory. Uh, and then second, we need to see God in His glory. And thirdly, we'll look that you've got to preach it to your soul. And fourthly, you need to be overtaken with God's glory. So let's take up this first point. I just, God in His glory, that just jumps out in this psalm. That is what is central to David's heart, is our great God. It's looking at God and all of His fullness as a saving God and being drawn into it and then your heart just wanting to worship. So worship begins and worship ends with God. It's not us. That isn't where it begins or ends. It's, it's, it's not our, our life or our circumstances or our feelings. The key to our worship of praise and thanksgiving is God. And we, we just gather as the assembly and we get lost in God and we sing his praises and we take his word and we stare at God. You need nothing else to fuel that this morning and every morning the rest of your life. You have God. What more do you need to worship? He's glorious, he's beautiful, he's majestic. And so that's what David is just looking at, all of his glory. And what is revealed about God in this psalm that he's unfolding is his majesty and also his humility and dealing gently and kindly with his children. And so you see how majestic and, and awesome he is, and yet he's a, a father who, who's tender with his children. It's overwhelming the beauty of, of what we're seeing. It's our Father who art in heaven. He's the God who reigns supreme, and yet for the first time we now pray our Father. And so we, we have the sovereign one that we're praying to who's our Father, and that is just encompassing this psalm of majesty and humility uh, in our God. So God and all of his greatness is the foundation stone of our worship. He is the center of it. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Our second point then is we need to see God in his glory. We need to see it. So the first point, God is just glorious. It's who he is. And then the second, we got to see it. In Exodus 34, Moses is going to lead the people out of, of slavery and bondage and, and show me your glory, God. Let me see it. And God says, I'm going to let it pass. I'm going to cover you and you're going to see it. <clears throat> and then here it is in Exodus 34, 5 through 7. <clears throat> the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with them as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and this is what he declared his glory. The Lord, Yahweh. The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands and he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And so here's the glory of God is what we're going to look at in Psalm 103. It's almost word for word, the, the same ideas and concepts. And here's the glory of God. He's a saving God. And that's what the psalm is about, a glorious God who saves and shows mercy upon whom he desires. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the gospel's veiled to those who are perishing because the God of this world has blinded their minds, uh, their minds so they can't see the glory of Christ. And then he says, God said, let there be light, and the veils pulled back so that you could see the glory of God in the face of Christ and in the knowledge of this Christ. So we, we see his glory. That's salvation. As now we get to see that this God is glorious. It's not just doctrines and some God up there. He's glorious. This is for God's children. The root of praise is that God is your father throughout this psalm. As you dig in, you'll just see again and again, that's the foundation stone to all the praise. 
God is your father. And that can only be done by the forgiveness of sins. You're an enemy. You've got to be able to be brought near to have him as a close Abba Dada father. And so what, what it does, forgiveness restores us back to God and it brings us into adoption. Father, son, or daughter. That's this gospel. It can bring you into the family of God. And so this is big. We, we have to get this if we're ever going to bless the Lord. It's got to go into the heart and bring this out. And that's why David is praising and blessing God. Psalm 103, 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The Lord can be your father. Yahweh can be your father. You can pray, our father who art in heaven. Galatians 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, which we're going to study in the weeks ahead, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you're an heir of God. That's Psalm 103 in a nutshell. You have been given the spirit of God, and you now cry for the nearness, Abba, Daddy relationship. This is the heart of why Christ came, Paul tells us in Galatians 4. This is at the heart of all the blessing of Psalm 103. So let me try then and unpack this big, beautiful thought here. And I hate to do this to you, but I've got you know, four points for you this morning. And now under the second point, I got four sub points. <laughs> but this is so rich. You just, I need you to work with me. <clears throat> so let's look at these sub points. Don't get lost. And I'll keep telling you sub point number one, and we'll work through this. So sub point number one, covenantal love is flowing in this section. Do you remember uh, one of my favorite Old Testament words is the word hesed. It doesn't mean therefore. <laughs> it, it's better. It means God's covenantal love, his faithfulness, his loving kindness. It's that in covenant, God is for you now in this new covenant. It's a, it's a covenant of love that nothing can separate you from it now. It is an eternal covenant covenant that you've been brought into and, and all you can ever know is the love of God in Christ Jesus in this hesed commitment that God has to his people. And so today what we are told is, hey, we're all children of God. Is that true? <laughs> it's a tricky question. Yes and no, right? It, it, it really matters. It, listen to Acts 17, 28. For in him we live, move, and exist and as some of our poets have said, we are also his offspring. So in one sense, we, we've all been born, you know, you give your life from God. He gives life to you. And so in a, a certain sense, he's the, the father of creation. But in the sense of creator God, we're all his children. But this psalm is something bigger. This psalm is about a recreator God making sons and daughters who are going to be brought near into hesedness. They're going to be brought into a covenantal love relationship where he now becomes Abba, Father. He's not this to everybody. This is only to the sons and daughters of God. And he's saying, here is what you get, sons and daughters, that you come now and he is your Abba and you stand in grace and the favor and love of God. You stand in it. There's full acceptance, full love in this new covenant. He's your father and he's safe and you love him. And so there's the beauty of, of this uh, whole glorious reality. Listen to John. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become what? Children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So to those who receive him and believe in him, they become this hesed, covenantal love, God's people. So there's a God who takes sinners and he brings them into a covenant of loving kindness. And he adopts them as children in the family of God. And John says, for such we are, we're the children of God. And if that overtakes your heart, God has given you his spirit so you'll know it. That will be one who just praises God the rest of their days on this earth. But you got to get this. 
And so the call of the psalm, look at verse 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on what? Those who fear him. Verse 18, to keep to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. These are the children of God. This is not everybody. So I want you to just start with that. He, he is not a father like this to everyone. What a privilege you have to have God as a father like this psalm. And so the foundation of our praise and worship and thanksgiving that will go for all of eternity is that God has brought you back into covenantal love that is eternal and kept because it is not based on the first Adam's disobedience, but on the second Adam's perfect obedience and not ours. So you're going to come into this covenant not based on you and what you can do and perform, but on what the second Adam did who lived a perfect life and died a death in our place. That's how you're going to be brought into this beautiful covenantal relationship through Christ's work. There's nothing more and real and more secure than our adoption as children of God who cry, Abba, Father. And I just want you to look at verse 8 of Psalm 103 and just listen then to how a father deals with his children. <clears throat> in verse 8, the Lord is what? He's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and overflowing and abounding in hesedness, loving kindness. He'll not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. I love this verse. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. That's the foundation of all of my, my praise. He hasn't dealt with you for what your sins deserve. He hasn't rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us as we sit here this morning. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame and he's mindful that we're but dust. He knows our frailties and shortcomings. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. But when the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. <laughs> it's eternal. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. That's what comes to the children of God. Second, sub point. Then you got to live into this love of adoption. One of the hardest things is for adopted children to live into the love that their new parents have for them. And I, I've seen the same for God's adopted children. One of the hardest things in shepherding is for some people to believe that God is their father and he loves you unconditionally. It's just the hardest thing you've ever had to believe. And you fight it and you wrestle it. And there's a battle to live into the fullness of the reality that we're seeing in Psalm 103. And when you do, everything changes. And maybe why we get so little, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, is because you don't know the fullness of the adoption that you have received as children of God. So you, you kind of live always just feeling on the outside, and if you do something wrong, God really is going to put you off and get rid of you. And so you, you just, you never enter into the fullness of what this psalmist has here this morning. And I want, I want this for everybody sitting here this morning. David says, uh, he's a father from everlasting to everlasting. His love is upon those who have hesed, his covenantal love. And so I, I want you to hear this. He loves you, child of God, despite your sins and flaws. And so it's not how much you get rid of them and all of these things, then God can finally love me. I want you to see that you can't be any more loved than you are sitting here today by faith in Jesus Christ. You can't be any more loved because you're in Christ and he loves you to the same degree he loves his own son. Does that make you want to bless the Lord? Oh, my soul. 
His love doesn't go up and down based on your performance. Isn't that good news? He loves you in Christ. And, and, and I just read this author. He loves you the same on your worst day. Do you believe that? That's a good test to see how you're doing with this. He loves you on your worst day. I heard a preacher a while back, and he put it, he really helps my understanding on this. He put it like this. He said, many view God like a boss. And when you think of a boss, you know, you can have a great relationship with a boss. It's very cordial. As long as you perform and do your job well, you get a Christmas gift, a paycheck. There's just a great relationship, right? Except in the back of your mind, you have this one thought. If I don't perform and blow it, it could change. Uh, this great relationship could change overnight if I keep blowing it, and he could fire you, and guess what? The relationship's over, done. How many of you are just stuck in that mindset this morning? This is natural, and it's inward, and it's what the world preaches on every angle. And you know what this does? <clears throat> your worship rises on when you do well and goes down when you do poor. All your worship is based on you and how you're performing instead of God. God doesn't fire you when you blow it. I still have a job. I'm not on thin ice this morning. Hessedness. His love is for you as a father. And you'll never get to Psalm 103 with this performance feeling. It will always be restraining your full abundant worship like David in this psalm. You'll, you'll always just rise and fall. You'll never get to this place. The kind of praise that this Psalm 103 is only comes from people who, who, like a David, has committed royal rape and murder. Murder. And he found a father who forgave him. He's still in hessedness with God after that. So if he wrote this when he's older, he's already been through that, just worshiping God that you didn't throw me aside when I did that. You restored me and you brought me back into covenantal love. This is for people who have really blown it. <laughs> They've come to see their true hearts and they see their sin for what it is against this holy God. I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I've found the steadfast, faithful love of God toward them only because of Christ and the new covenant. The only way I can have this is because of Jesus Christ and being brought into this hessedness, this covenantal love of Jesus that now God loves me from everlasting to everlasting and he's not dealing with my sins for what they deserve because he did it in a better way that I'll go over in a second. Has every reason to cast you off and he draws you closer. Amen? And he's, he's a father, not a boss. I was thinking about my own children this week and there are times when they didn't perform, per, perform well. There were a lot of times they didn't perform well. And as they got to be teenagers sometimes, in sin, they would stand against me with a little battery on their shoulder. I dare you to knock this off. Uh, there's been seasons of really struggling. And what happened in my own heart when they were struggling is it, it drew me closer to them. What it did is it intensified my love. My covenantal love as their dad has never been based on their performance. And it's been based that you're my son or daughter and you have my love when you're doing well and when you're doing poorly, I am just as committed, sometimes more committed when you're doing poorly based on being a son or daughter. And what David is amazed at, in spite of all my iniquity, his love is everlasting. Not do something. All my iniquity, his love is everlasting. How sweet is this? Jesus, teach us to pray. Our Father. The crowd should have stoned him. The unspeakable four letters. Now pray, Our Father. Does that blow you away? I, I believe you should never get over this. I think of all of God's attributes and his titles, the sovereign one, the judge, the ruler, 
Yahweh, Supreme One, and all that He's revealed Himself, and all that God is. This psalm is telling me something beautiful. All these attributes and titles are filtered through His fatherhood toward me. All those attributes come to me through fatherhood. And I just think of the number one way that God reveals Himself to us is in His holiness. A thousand times He reveals Himself as holy. His power and His glory and His majesty fills the Scriptures. And all of that is filtered to you as a father with His love upon you. He's a holy father. He's, he's all of these things and it filters through all these attributes are for you in a covenantal love relationship because of Jesus Christ. That's how we relate to God. He's still holy, but he's my father, our father who art in heaven. We have to live into this and it will overwhelm you if you get this because God said, it's hard to get. So I gave my spirit who will tell you this. And when he does, you're going to say, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Third sub point. Boy, this could be long. <clears throat> what is the hardest part about living into this reality? What, what, why do we battle this? Why is this so hard for us? And I've got two answers, and there's probably a bunch of them. But the two I, I'm going to hit is when we sin. When we sin, it's hard to believe it. We pull an atom, we hide, we make fig, fig leaves, and we, with just our shame and our guilt, and we're hiding from God. In verse 3, he says, he pardons all your iniquities. In verse 10, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Sin does not break his covenantal love. It's all over the psalm. I'm amazed at what my sins deserve before salvation and afterwards, even more so because of all the knowledge that I have of Christ. <laughs> I deserve destruction. And he gives me absolute mercy. I just get so tired of me. I want to be done with me. I, I get done with a quiet time and I'm just going to live for you the rest of my life and within 10 minutes I can commit sin. And I'm amazed at a God who's my father who does not throw me off. He will not punish me the way my sins deserve because he punished his son for what my sins deserve. That is the grace of Almighty God. And we have to live into that. And when we do, it will produce great praise and worship to this God alone. And if you live into this, this is for free. You'll make a great dad. This is the kind of dads that... that just bless. And I pray that you could behold this and be that kind of dad in your home. And the other time when it's hard to believe this is when hard things come upon us. In uh, verse 8, he's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness, but he'll not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. And so this was pointed out again uh, from a, something I heard, I think it was a couple weeks ago, but he said, a father still gets angry at you. Uh, there's a holy, righteous anger in verse 9. And so there's a, a father who will discipline you for your good, according to Hebrews 12. And so there's a father who will deal with you. And this guy gave an illustration that helped me. He said, think of a parent. Uh, say your child tells a lie and you punish him and say, Timmy or Jimmy. I don't know if we have Jimmy's or not, Jimmy, you can't go to the party tonight. The reason you did this is so that the consequence will teach your son or daughter not to lie. I, I don't want them to lie, and, and my hope is to wake them up and destroy their lives so they don't become liars. But what is it that happens with some parents? My flesh is Timmy, Jimmy, because I know a couple Timmys, and I just don't want it to be, I don't want it to be that personal. All right, Tim, Tim, you made me mad and you inconvenienced me and you made me look bad at church. You ruined my day. I'm going to ruin yours. I'm mad. Go to your room. That's what comes out. And what this Psalm tells us 
God never does that. He doesn't give retributive justice to his children because he already did. He gave it to his only begotten son on a cross so that now he can just give his children discipline to mold and to shape you with trials, with the heart of a father to keep you on the path of holiness and righteousness. And so nothing has come upon you, child of God, this morning that is just punishing you and making you miserable for no reason. God can't do that to his children. It's impossible. And so what is upon you as a loving father who handpicks and decrees and gets the exact things that will draw out more holiness and get rid of more sin? And you got to get to the point where you trust him. And it isn't always he's against me and he hates me. This is, this is where you start to not believe the fatherhood of God as you look at your life. And because there's trials and disciplines, it proves you're a child of God. If you have no trials at all in your life, get a little bit nervous as to whether you're a child of God. And so that's when we tend to doubt his fatherhood, when more than ever, we should thank him for his fatherhood to bring affliction, discipline, and squeezings into our lives. Romans 8, 28. And this can cause us to bless the Lord after our sin and in the midst of hardship and trial. You can literally worship and praise him in the midst of confession and forgiveness and in the hardest trial that you're facing this morning, you can still cry out, Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Some of my best times of worship have been after the rod that has made me smart. And I don't mean smart, I mean smart. Okay. Fourth sub point. Don't get nervous, the last two main points go really fast. <laughs> so this is a call then to be intimate with your father. In verse 8, he's compassionate and gracious in this hessedness. And in verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. Compassion is a very strong and emotional word. The bowels of compassion, they're deep emotions. And I was reminded and began to meditate on it a, a couple of weeks ago. I was thinking back to when my kids were, were, were little babies. And I don't know if any of you know this about me. I love to rock a rocking chair. Like anytime I sit down, I'm in a rocking chair. I just, I love it. And I got to be moving. Laura was wise. She would just take those little wrapped up little burritos and stick them in my arms. And I would rock and sing like a rhinestone cowboy and all these <laughs> different, different songs off key and all of those good things. But th those were such intimate times. I remember several times just tears coming down, just looking at my children and thanking God for that gift and, and all that they meant to me. And whenever they would get hurt as little toddlers, they would toddle up to me and just come and be snuggled. And when I would discipline them, they, I remember a two-year-old going, restoration, you know, and just, uh, come here, let me give you that restoration. And, and then they would share, we'd drive to the store and they, they would tell you everything. They would just talk. They were just little chatterboxes. And then hormones came in. Puberty. I think I've told you that the longest 20 years of my life was puberty. <laughs> and then they become teenagers and you just don't get all those moments the same. But what I want you to hear is, is this, what we read this morning in our time of worship. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Uh, you're, you're, you're not... Um, just slaves in the house, your, your children. But you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, and the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Guys, this is a call to intimacy. He knows our frame. He's mindful that we're but dust. All of our failings, all of our shortcomings. He doesn't deal with our sins the way they should. And, and he just says, come near. You have a Holy Spirit. Abba, draw near. Has the gospel broken down the enmity between you and God? And I mean this. I shepherd this so often where there's still enmity between you and God. And you can't draw near in this beautiful way that the psalmist is talking about. You can't have this kind of intimacy with God because you don't believe that that wall has been broken down in Christ. 
and that you have full access to him as a father. And so I'm going to shoot as straight with you as I know how. If God is just cold and distant, all he is is theological. You relate to him only through commentaries and books. You pray, but in all honesty, it's these and thous, and it just feels like you're talking to a ceiling. Your life is just discipline. You discipline yourself to a distant God. You've missed the whole Christian life. You've failed. You've missed the whole thing doing that. Don't feel good about it. Don't sit and smile how disciplined you are with this God you don't know. Don't, don't love that. Abba. This gospel is to bring about the intimacy with your God who's dealt with your sins and his son and can now draw you near in full access, adoption, fatherhood, intimacy. That's what this gospel is about. I'll, I'll bring you back to me. Do you know this? Abba, has the Spirit done this? If it never goes beyond the other and all you do is have a distant God, you will never worship it's just, you're going to need smoke and mirrors like we see all over our country. You're going to need external creeds and liturgy and stained glass windows. And the only kind of worship I can have is if it's not a 500-year-old hymn, I can't worship. That's what's going to come out. Just this cold, external. I, 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 it's all the externals that are my worship instead of this God that my spirit draws near and knows and loves and says, bless the Lord, O my soul. If this breaks in by the Spirit, the truth of the gospel in Christ, worship and praise will fill your life and your heart all of your days, and sin and trials will only enhance it. What I see in this church are so many people, when the squeezings come, your worship gets higher, bigger, and stronger. I bumped into a guy at a coffee shop from this church who's been going through a horrible trial. And he's glowing because God has been so close and near to his heart in this trial. That's what this will do when you behold this. This psalm is at the heart of thanksgiving. Well, how do I get this? 2,000 years ago, the true son, the best son, he didn't pray, Abba. The only time he never said Abba was on that cross. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer is so that my sons and daughters will never feel the separation and the destruction that you are now enduring. My children will only know Abba for all of eternity because Jesus lost Abba for those three hours on that cross. I will deal with them on that basis now. And God says, all of my goodness and all of my fullness will operate toward them in this relationship of hesedness. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm done with subpoints. Third point, guys. There's one response, then preach, preach to your soul this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, my nephesh, my innermost being, my heart, just everything within me. Praise this God. I look at what we just went over, and all I want to do now is bless his name, give glory to him, praise wonders. He's worthy of it all. Give me that. Verse 3, he pardons all your iniquities and heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, and he just goes on and on and on, and I'm out of time, but just go read those and marvel and praise God. So where this should come, there's times that you're not letting these truths arouse your soul to bless and praise God. Preach to your soul. Soul, look at these benefits. Don't forget them. And just start praising him and worshiping him again. When you get lost in work or little kids or whatever you're doing, fight and preach to your soul again. He's worthy to be blessed and praised. And then fourthly, be overtaken with it. Look in verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you, his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word in heaven. 
Bless the Lord, all you his hosts who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all your works, everything created, all places of his dominion, which is everywhere. Just my soul, bless the Lord. And it's just, it's just growing and building and he's so taken up with God. Soul, bless God. Everybody in Southside Bible Church, bless God. Everything that God made, trees, birds, everything, bless God. He's worthy of all the universe to praise and worship him for being a saving, glorious, loving God. May we worship this God. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And John says, see how great the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. We're the children of God of God because of God's graciousness in sending his son into this world. (laughs) Are you fired up for Thursday? I just, man, bless them. Praise them and thank them. And I thank God for David and the Holy Spirit giving us Psalm 103. Let's go to our God and pray. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless your holy name, oh God. Let us not forget all the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus, they are ever flowing, overflowing, and abundant. He's, I love your word, God. He's full. Out of his fullness, we've received grace and truth. This Christ is so full. And every blessing, every spiritual blessing comes from that fountain. So come thou fount of every blessing. God, let every heart and soul now just bless your name. God, if any unbeliever walked in here this morning, I pray, let them look to this beautiful Christ and let them see him dying in their stead, dying in their place for their sins, and that even now they would call upon the name of the Lord and they would join us in this last song and bless the name of God as a children, as a child of God here this morning. I pray you would do that mighty work in our midst. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.